Welcome back everybody to Geology 101. For this section, we talk about the motion of the ocean, waves, tides, and currents. So in the previous section, we covered these two, understanding how plate tectonics controls key coastal processes and being able to distinguish active and passive margin coastlines. Here, we're going to explain some of the mechanisms behind the movement of Earth's water. So Earth's water is moving around. There are different patterns, different forcing mechanisms that make this really, really interesting. And it's these sorts of mechanisms we can talk about with respect to shaping the geology of the coast. But before we get the coastal piece and the geology piece into it, we have to talk more broadly about the earth science aspect of moving water. We'll talk about currents, we'll talk about tides, we'll talk about waves in that order. Now, there is also a factor here of sea level rise, for now, I'm going to leave this out of the video. We'll cover it more in our assignment for the week. So we're going to start with our big picture first. This is going to be our ocean currents. The water in the oceans is not flowing around randomly. It's not something that changes every day, quite like the weather would be. Instead, we have these continuous, recognizable patterns of flow. What drives these patterns? That's going to be wind, density differences, and water masses, which reflect temperature and salinity differences, the so-called thermohaline forces, which then are forced by gravity to differentiate different water bodies from one another, leads to the pattern that we will see, and to a lesser degree events like earthquakes and storms, although these are not going to cause a pattern like this for the whole Earth to emerge. Uh, lastly, we have to talk about everything involved with ocean currents as being a reflection of plate tectonics. So as the different continents move in different places around the Earth, these ocean currents reflect those changes. They cannot float through the continents, and so plate tectonics is going to be a big control on this as well. So this is our global ocean current map. We have our warmer waters in pink and our cooler waters in blue. And what is the process? What is the story? What does this actually look like? The equator is going to be a place that receives a lot of direct sunlight. The water there tends to warm up. It warms up. It might come over here and hit something that blocks its path, like the continents, forces it to move northward. As it moves northward, it starts to cool and then comes back down, for example, here in California, as cooler waters, traveling all the way back down to the equator where it warms up once again. So this would be one of our big circulating cells here. We can see something uh, similar, but largely the opposite down here in the Pacific Ocean. We have warm water traveling largely westward around the equator. It comes here. It hits this continental landmass and travels here, all the way down south into the Antarctic region. It starts to get cooler. As it gets cooler and hits this continent here, it travels back up, gets warmer, and the process repeats again. And we can actually see the same thing happening over here. Right? We have our equator, so it gets warm at the equator, comes over here to the continent, brings some heat up here, travels up north, and in this case, I think it's a Gulf Stream, continues, but part of it comes back down as the cooler water, and the cell repeats. We can see the same sort of circulation pattern of the cell, right? Clockwise here, clockwise here in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise here, counterclockwise here in the southern hemisphere for these different currents. There's also something really important here. We have this circumpolar or Antarctic current. So you can actually see, right, we travel it here, and it actually goes all the way around the entire continent of Antarctica. So if we were looking at it on the globe, and we look at the part with Antarctica, it would look like it was traveling around in a circle. This actually has a huge impact in keeping Antarctica cold and keeping this ice sheet from melting. It's part of the reason why the Antarctic has this ice sheet in the first place, is because this has been so cool for so long. Now, you might imagine a past time, maybe 10, 20 million years ago, where South America here was so close to Antarctica that it actually blocked this current off. And I would ask you, what do you think was the result? Was it easier or harder to get this ice sheet on Antarctica? And there's one more important aspect to talk about here. Uh, notice these lines, right? We have one running here above the equator, or north of the equator, one running here south of the equator. And you can look and see, well, there's this huge desert here that's right on the line, desert here that's right on the line. Looking at the other, right? We have this dashed line, and there's a huge desert, this arrow right on the line, huge desert here right on the line. And I'm not going to tell you why this is. We're just going to foreshadow this for a future unit. This is what we will be covering in the very last unit of the course, deserts. Now, so far, we've been talking about these surface currents, things that are in the top 200 meters of the ocean. But there are different currents that occur in the deeper ocean, everything from 300 meters and below. Now, all of these currents, shallow and deep, have this job of regulating Earth's climate system on a global scale. Right? They take heat 
from the warmer areas in the equator and they move it to these colder areas of the pole. Uh, these surface currents and the deeper currents are actually connected into one big conveyor belt, and that's what we're going to look at here. So this is our biggest, most important ocean current system. We have our red, which is the warmer flow, going to be closer to the surface, and here in blue we have our cooler, deeper ocean current. Now we'll start at the equator, or something that is roughly at the equator, equatorial. It's going to be warmer. Uh, because the Earth rotates counterclockwise, winds at the equator tend to blow from east to west, and water is going to flow in the same way. It flows here. It can't go through Africa, so it has to come around, and it can't flow through South America, so it gets forced up. In fact, it gets forced all the way up to about the Arctic Circle here with Greenland, and it melts some of the ice here on Greenland and starts to get colder and also fresher. All the glacial ice here is fresh water. This is going to decrease the salinity in the water, and it's also going to make it cooler at the same time, which causes it to get denser and causes it to drop down to the ocean floor. So now we have, in almost the same location here, this deeper, colder current, right? It can't go here through North America. It's forced downward, forced downward here at South America. It comes all the way down here, flows now from west to east, along the Antarctic, comes all the way up to the Pacific Ocean, and once it starts to get into this region, it is heated once more by all the forces at the equator. As it's heated, it starts to rise up. It starts to flow from east to west as a warm surface current once again, and we're back where we started. This is our global thermohaline circulation conveyor belt. Now, there is a one ocean current in particular which is important not just for us in the United States, but also for people in Europe, and this is called the Gulf Stream. Here's how it works. We start with warm water in the Caribbean, Bahamas here. That warm water is going to travel up along the east coast of the United States and arrive across the Atlantic in northern Europe, bringing heat with it. Uh, you might notice, right, looking at the latitudes here, that uh, Great Britain, Ireland, are at the same latitude as a lot of the parts of Canada, actually. Uh, places in Canada which are extremely cold, which most people would not want to live in. So the question is, why doesn't England have the same weather and climate patterns as these parts of Canada? And the Gulf Stream would be the reason for that. It brings a tremendous amount of heat to all these countries in northern Europe. It also comes up here, melts some of the Greenland ice, starts to get fresher, gets colder, and drops back down, brings cool water down south through here. Um, it is a fact, seems to be relatively well established, that this Gulf Stream process, bringing heat to Northern Europe, is weaker now than at any point in the last 1600 years, and apart from that, it is a very fast-moving current here. brings a lot of water through. Okay, so I would not be doing my job here unless I told you a little bit about the Gulf Stream as it relates to climate change, and of course, you don't have to believe anything just because I say it. You can check this for yourself. It is pretty well established that this Gulf Stream is getting weaker, it is slowing down, and therefore bringing less heat along with it, controlling the temperature less, and this seems to be related to the warming trend for the entire Earth. Temperatures are going up, this is a fact, and therefore it is related to human activities which contribute to those rising temperatures. Um, in the climate change model overall, this Gulf Stream system, which you hear uh, the AMOC is their name for it, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, otherwise known as the Gulf Stream. It is a potential tipping point for the model, one which is very difficult to completely understand. I have included some stuff here from the IPCC, International Climate Change Bodies Assessment Report. You can read it if you'd like. I won't comment on what they have to say. Let's go ahead and pause here for now. I'll pick up in another video to finish out the section.